female Olympian. Um, I can't say the Olympics is doing it for me at the moment, but we shall see. Helen Dale is here. Let's see whether she's watching it. Helen, a very good uh, morning to you. Good morning, Mike. How are you? I'm all right. <laughs> Not bad at all. Notwithstanding the ridiculous construction of an artificial hill of mud uh, in Marble Arch for no apparent reason. I mean, apparently Westminster City... Call it. I can't call it what I want to call it and what people have been calling it <laughs> all around the place because otherwise your producer will leap across the studio and hit the big big red of button. Yes, exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. Very wise too. But the thing is, I mean, I'm looking out the window here and I can see the Tower of London, uh, a beautiful, magnificent structure, Tower Bridge, which is also fascinating. Um, even if I looked the opposite direction, I'd see St Paul's Cathedral, Buckingham Palace just over there you know these apparently are not things which will attract any tourists to come to london they would prefer according to westminster city council come uh, to look at a hill the marble arch mound yes that's repeatable it, it beggars belief really doesn't it that some of these people get into power and, and this is what they do with million it. quid pile of dirt yeah you don't you love it I, I mean, it, it, in many in many ways, it symbolises a great deal of what we've been dealing with for the last kind of year, really, doesn't it? These are the kind of people that run the city of London. These are the kind of people that think that they know what they're doing. And the best thing they can come up with is this. Yes, I know. Amazing. I did laugh. I did laugh. <laughs> well, it's just it's you... sad and expensive, but. Yes, it is. It really is. <laughs> now, let's talk about this book that you've just reviewed for the critic, because it's kind of interesting in its way, but it takes a little bit of, of, of explaining. Can you do that yes, for us? I will do. The book is called The End of the World is Flat, and it's by Simon Edge. And it's about flat earthery yes. people who think that the the earth is flat. And yes, I did get lots of jokes when I tweeted my review yesterday <laughs> from the magazine. This is the latest issue of the magazine, which should be in shop soon. The okay. Critic. And it's a bumper issue. So uh, I'm holding up the book now for people on talk radio TV. It's got a statue of Christopher Columbus on mm. the front and a picture of the UN symbol. Now, what Simon Edge has done, now he's a comic writer, he's a satirist, and this is his fifth novel, and it's probably going to be his most popular one. He's he, he's quite likely to have um, hit the big time. Mm. And yes, lots of jokes about a bloke with the surname Edge writing about uh, flat earth and people saying, well, if the earth were flat, cats would have knocked everything off it already and <laughs> those sorts of comments. Yes. And on one level, it's a satire of Stonewall. A lot of people have made that comment that, you know, this is how a charitable organisation that's kind of run out of legs because it's achieved its aims, then goes, gets knocked off course and starts trying to get people to believe in pseudoscience. Yes. And on one level, that's true. But it's a wider satire than that, and you don't need to know the first thing about Stonewall or the trans debate to thoroughly mm. enjoy this book. Yes. Because it's a satire of Twitter. Mm. Well, reading, and, reading your piece, as I did this morning, um, it struck me that it's a pretty good allegory for the way that rewriting of history has now become a thing, whereby... This is it's not, absolutely it's, correct. Yeah, it's not just about one issue, but it's about almost every issue that we deal with in, in the world, that some people who don't like certain parts of our history are just seeking to rewrite it. And... The point that Edge makes, and this is hence the Christopher Columbus point, which I don't mention in my review, mm. is that, uh, and I didn't realise this, it, it shows you there's quite a lot of history in it, although it's also very funny as well, um, that uh, people have known that the earth was round uh, for a very long time. This idea that people in the Middle Ages believed that the earth was flat and Christopher Columbus proved them wrong, that's actually one of those classic examples of cod history, false history. Mm. And every time you see someone making the argument, they're being ridiculously silly. Now, I knew as a classicist, because my, my first degree is in classics before I became a lawyer to pay the bills, I knew as a classicist that both the Greeks and the Romans knew the earth was round, and the Romans in particular were quite good at exploration, and there's some evidence that they got down to as far as the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, trying to find things, probably slaves, realistically, being the kind of civilization that they were, but also precious metals and uh, and goods for trade mm. and, and so on and so forth. And the way they, and because earlier, pr the civilization preceding the Romans, the Greeks were very good at mathematics, they actually used trigonometry to work out the circumference of the earth 
with a fair degree of accuracy mm. using shadows, you know, uh, you know, the classic trigonometry yeah. thing where you get a pole with a shadow in one area and then you go a certain distance and get a shadow in the other area and then calculate the circumference based on the curvature. And the, the Romans used that in a practical, technical way because they were very good at map making. And what happens in the book, he based Simon Edge builds up this information and background about Christopher Columbus and what he did know and what he didn't know and what people were saying, is you have a charity in London, and it's a very London-centric book. If you've ever spent time in London, you will get a lot of pleasure out of reading the book. He knows the city very well. Um, a charity that's devoted to map making has finished its worldly tasks and should really wind itself up but it doesn't and people don't want to lose their jobs the book is compassionate and gets across to you why people don't want to lose their jobs at the charity and don't want to go job hunting and so on and so forth and so what then happens is the charity is there's a stealth takeover by a, a big tech billionaire in silicon valley who has it got in his bubble in Palo Alto in California. And there's a, a backstory to this as well about flat earthery going back to antiquity. And he thinks the earth is flat and he wants to use this British charity's credentials to try to convince people that the earth is flat. And as part of this process, this, the experienced geographer who's the CEO, her name is Mel Winterbourne in the book, she gets sacked, she gets shoved out the door. And to shut her up, they, she's paid an enormous amount of money. But in order to get the money, she signs a non-disclosure agreement. And there's a nice twist in the tale with that part of the plot. And then, of course, the new chap who takes over, his name's Shane Foxley, the character, he doesn't really believe that the earth is flat. He thinks this is nonsense. Right. But he's just but doing it for the money. Is, but he's doing it for the money. So he tries to come up with a way of convincing people that there are problems with geography before he tries to get into proper flat earthery. Right. And the way he does it, and he buys lots of Twitter bots and and you know literally if there's a there's an issue he can just throw money at it. He tries to build up this a historical nonsense by arguing that traditional geography is racist. <laughs> so Well it's and, got me laughing. Oh yeah and one of the things he does Well I'm of course it to, must be racist because it's clearly imperialist, is it not? Well yes, because a lot of it goes back to the Romans and then yeah. to the Portuguese and the Spanish and the British and all of that kind of thing. And one of the things that Simon Edge does, and I'm holding this up for people on Talk Radio TV, is he recreates Twitter debates mm. in the book, and it's very, very cleverly printed by his publisher. He recreates Twitter debates where the way that the people who work for the map making charity, which is called the Orange Peel Foundation, uh, get their way and try to shut other people up is by constantly accusing them, making false accusations of racism, yeah. which is something we are all familiar with. And also just generally dogpiling people, shutting down debates, going behind people's backs and getting them sacked. And there's an extraordinary scene where a geography teacher in Woking gets the sack because she won't get rid of the globe, the spinning globe she's got in her classroom to teach her A-level geography students. And it's, it shows you how you can get an enormous amount of traction on social media and appear to be this giant, roaring, fire-breathing dragon that's got everybody behind you when the rest of the general public if you outside of social media if you talk to them about this they'd be going what yes what are you on well funnily and enough even as we speak helen it's all going on around us because um of what happened yesterday with the rnli um the royal national lifeboat uh, institution uh, which is supposedly uh, been targeted by people who are having to go at them for rescuing all these migrants from the channel who don't really need rescuing and it's become this ridiculous debate now not about whether or not the rnli are doing the right thing but whether or not whoever is supporting the rnli is a good person and anyone who's being critical of what they're doing is a racist and simon edge in the book which i recommend you read because it's very funny and it's a very light read it's a great summer beach read just to sit there and read but he includes an afterward and i don't and without it doesn't this has got no spoilers in it. I've deliberately set this up so there are no spoilers at the end. What he does is he points out 
how it has become impossible in a number of areas to have adult conversations about a wide number of issues and it's because of Twitter. And I have to say, I got to the end of it and uh, I mean, and there are various things. Is there racism in football? Can't have an adult conversation. Mm. Immigration policy, can't have an adult conversation about it. Uh, prisons policy, crime reduction, sexual harassment, crime rates as a per, you know, perpetrated by immigrants as opposed to people who already live here. Um, refugees, asylum. You can't have adult conversations about this and a great deal of it is because of Twitter. And one of the points he makes in the book is that he spent, and the reason he could write it so quickly, is he spent as a result of lockdown all this time on social media, particularly Twitter. Mm. And it got to the point where it was basically sending him bonkers. Well, it does. I think that is the and point. it does. I think you have to realise, I mean, if I didn't have a, the job that I have, I just wouldn't be on it at all because there's no, no point. The point of me being on it uh, is that I promote my show, I promote other things that I do, podcasts, etc., and it's a worthy kind of engine for me uh, to, to hook people into what I do and it can spread far and wide and I can get a bigger audience out there by addressing certain things. But if I was just an ordinary individual, I wouldn't be bothered with it because it is literally a cesspit of madness. It is just mad. And there is the thing, and, and Simon Edge does this really well with the geography teacher who gets the sack. Um, he, he, he does this very well in this, this whole thing of you get on it and it's the, like the Carl Benjamin joke that happened when he was a UKIP candidate where he made one off colour joke on Twitter and that was the end of him, uh, where join Twitter, start tweeting 10 years later, get sacked. Surprise! <laughs> you know, right. and... And, the, and this is exactly what happens. And you've got, and what happens is ordinary members of the public are scooped up in this. They're not famous people. Uh, and they're not people who can readily fight back like you can and I can. Um, you get ordinary members of the public sacked from their jobs from for one tweet, basically. And the thing is, and, and because Simon Edge is a writer, um, he, he understands this as well. The advantage that someone who's a professional writer or a professional journalist or in broadcasting has got your sort of background or my sort of background is that we can say, I'm a professional writer. I'll choose my words. Yes. Don't police my speech. Mm. Whereas ordinary members of the public are in a much, much more vulnerable position because it then turns into this huge argument of, about don't use that word, you have to use this word. Mm. And the way Edge does it in the book, he said uh, one of the things that this this COD foundation that has been taken over by nutters um, starts to do is you can't say global, you have to say worldwide. Yes. And so you get this policing of speech the same way that you get woman turned into person with a cervix or you're not allowed to say coloured person, you have to say person of colour. Yes. You know, and, and, Although and lately that's same... also that's also been put into question, I think, lately, hasn't Apparently it? Apparently you're not supposed to say it now. And, it's hard and to keep the, up. Yes. And the, and the thing is, uh, and these rules constantly evolve and only people who are very linguistically alert and who tend to be really quite posh and well educated and and i have seen simon edge in and i've heard him he did a very good interview for savage minds which is a, a magazine mm. where he talked about i have the sort of education and and, and posh background he he went to cambridge and he read philosophy and he's very clever where i can just sort of say no i don't have to wear this i don't have to cop this sort of nonsense you know but most people don't have that so people who are constantly changing the rules it's like courtiers uh, in France, in, in Ancien Régime France with Louis XIV mm. on, on the French throne where they they have to follow all these elaborate rules in order to get the king or the queen's favour. Yes. And if you don't know those elaborate rules, you're on the outer. And but this it, is, this is the ver and this is, of and this, and this, well, I'm going to ask you to stay, stay where you are for a moment, Hannah. We're just going to take a little break. But this is where it takes us into the realm of the social media kind of virtue signalling world where you say all the right things in order to get on in your job because if you say the wrong thing, you don't get on in your job. It's as simple as that. Helen Dale's with us. We'll be coming back to her very shortly. We want to talk about all the number of people that have been pinged in the last week. If you're one of them, I'd love to hear from you. Six, nearly 700,000 people pinged by the NHS COVID-19 app in England and Wales in the week ending July 21st. For heaven's sake, what is going on? This is Talk Radio. Online, on DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio.
This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB+, and on the Talk Radio app. The Independent Republic of Mike Gray on Talk Radio. Now, remember, Talk Radio is also available on TV now. It's on Apple TV, it's on Rakuten, it's on Samsung TV+, Plus. it's on Roku, and it's on YouTube. Uh, it is everywhere that you can find it. Uh, and all you've got to do is go here, talkradio.tv, or simply download the Talk Radio TV app from the App Store, and away we go. Uh, we're talking to Helen Dale. Uh, she's been telling us about this very, very interesting book about uh, the flat earthers of this world. One of the things that I found fascinating, Helen, and you can find some actual flat earthers on the old social media front if you look hard enough, uh, um, one of the things they like to do is to show a picture of a shoe uh, uh, with somebody's foot in it uh, pressed down on the earth and saying things like, if the earth isn't flat, why is the shoe flat? And you kind of go, well, I, if, you ca- if you have to ask me that question, I can't really help you. One of the points that Simon Edge makes in his book is that uh, you've got to be quite careful with things that are accepted scientific truths like that the earth is round or that there are two sexes Hmm. or that uh, there are uh, genetic differences between men and women and between different populations. You probably shouldn't call them races, but different populations. These are basic scientific truths. Now, this is why if you do, for example, trait-based medicine, like the effect on researching, for example, the effectiveness of the COVID vaccines, you have to make sure that you test test it on enough black people and brown people and not just white people, Mm. as well as men and women, because there are enough genetic differences to mean that medicine can have different effects. And you can have quite serious problems like painkillers for example, that work for women and don't work for men and Mm. vice versa. But the reason why you have to always be aware of the underlying factuality of these basic scientific truths is if you don't know them, you can really get tripped up. And and there's lots of scenes in Simon Edge's book where where people, including the main character, who isn't a flat earther, uh, but he's flying on an airplane at one point and he sees looking out the window and see, sees the uh, the earth out below him, the cloud formations and the, the land masses. And he realises, well, hang on, shouldn't the curvature of the earth be visible from an aeroplane? Right. And the thing is, because he doesn't know that in the particular context on the flight path that he's on, it isn't. Right. Because he's not high um, enough he, up, presumably. For a because lot he's not high enough up, he doesn't know how to fight back against people who are actual flat earthers. Yes. And the thing is, and I'll, I'll just sort of finish this point, that although the book is funny and very satirical, it's not mean. And that's quite hard to do in satire because one of the things with this the young bloke who is uh, in this charity supposedly trying to promote the idea of flat earth and by accusing everybody of racism, his husband is an NHS junior doctor who, like junior doctors, works very long hours. And there are, there's a scene there, and because obviously if you're an NHS junior doctor, your background is all STEM, it's all sciences, you know all of this stuff. And there's a scene where the two of them, the, the doctors finally got a night off and they are having a meal together in a good restaurant and having a couple of glasses of wine. And the, and the, the later on, the doctor thinks to himself, this is what led, partly what led to this, mm. is he's sitting there listening to his husband going, this is mad. This is bonkers. This is pseudoscientific nonsense. But he's so tired and he's so pleased to finally have some together time and to be in a nice, relaxed environment. And he's also aware in the back of his mind that it means that their income will increase because they're absolutely mortgaged up to the neck because they're trying to buy a house in Mm. London. Um, He just goes along with it. And that scene comes back to him repeatedly through the book where he's going, I gave him my blessing. And this is complete nonsense and it's turning our relationship to crud <laughs> and it's just and, and i mean the, the trouble is, is right as i'm listening to many of these stories you're telling me helen it's it's sounding very like real life i mean that's the tragedy of it it may well be satire but it's actually rather clever satire because it is actually true well this is and uh, this is what makes it so effective and this is why it's his fifth book but I think it's going to be a massive bestseller. And the reason I think it's going to be a massive bestseller is because while you're laughing at it, if you've ever 
been in a fight on Twitter and not said something because you don't want to be dogpiled. And that's quite a lot of people in the United Kingdom, I suggest. And it's not just, I mean, it's certainly not just me. And I mean, you, you're always in there and you're happy to fight the stooshies and so on and so forth. You're braver than I am. But anybody who has ever had that thought, oh, I just can't be asked getting into this fight. I'm just not going to. Oh. I just could not be bothered. Yeah. Life is too short. I mean, I do occasionally have those moments, not very often, but I do occasionally. And at this point, we must end it. Helen, thank you very much indeed. We're out of time. Helen Dale, uh, writer, lawyer, uh, political commentator, recommender of books. And this one actually does sound pretty good because many of you have already said you're going to be buying uh, the book and you've already ordered it. The End of the World is Flat by Simon Edge. Um, it sounds fascinating because it is very true. If you are on Twitter, if you are on any social media, you will know and you will recognise some of the scenarios that have been painted because, quite frankly, it is a ridiculous world. It's not real. Uh, it's populated by people uh, who are simply not being themselves. It's populated by people who, who dream up ridiculously kind of woke accounts, uh, ridiculously racist accounts, ridiculously uh, crazy accounts just to bother people that they think they like bothering because they seem to enjoy it. I don't understand anyone who gets any enjoyment out of doing Twitter uh, unless they are actually in some way um, ridiculous. And that's what I would say. I mean, I wouldn't be on it.